Okay, so we've heard some examples of how companies, both within financial services and, and outside financial services, can, can extend how they engage with customers and also the, the types of services they, they can offer. Now we're going to uh, hear from uh, Rana Perez, who's the CTO and co-founder of 101 Digital. And, and Rana, um, welcome. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to learning more about how you actually go about implementing open banking. So I'll, I'll just check your, your screen is okay. Uh, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, John, and good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, participate in uh, API Days. Uh, since uh, the launch of open banking in Europe in 2018, open banking has been steady, steadily uh, gaining momentum and fast becoming a global standard for banks and fintechs. Many countries across the world in every continent is now introducing open banking regulation uh, following similar model to the UK. At 101 Digital, over the last six or seven years, we have been working with organizations, banks and fintechs across different markets, helping them implement and launch uh, new banking and open banking business models and platforms. Over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I would like to share with you some insights derived from those implementation experiences and specifically on what are the typical types of problems banks are trying to solve with open banking and what are some of the strategic and very important decisions that these organizations, their banks or fintechs are faced with. And ultimately, how to make the best ROI on your open banking investment, how to maximize your ROI on the open banking investment. So let me uh, kick off with that and take a look at the take a look at the problem state. Let's, uh, let's face it, banking is not fun and sexy. So uh, when you get up in the morning, you take your app, take your device, and banking is not the first app you launch. So banks have traditionally struggled with the engagement challenge in order to engage the customers, provide them the services. Uh, how do you engage with the customers? Because the customer's attention is taken up by all the other things that are happening. On their device. Now, this is this is real data. What you see on this chart, and this is representation of if somebody had you know 10, 15 more commonly used apps on a device, which ones are getting the use? Maybe travel list not today at the same place, but you get the picture. Now, this is once again real data from a bank that we worked with. Um, here, the challenge is: okay, we have invested significantly on our digital channels online, mobile, uh, so on and so forth. However, what we see on the digital channels is really uh, servicing and transactions and not really new customer acquisition. So if you're investing on digital channels, what how most of the new banks do, and you heard examples of, uh, you know, from DBS of how they onboard customers for wealth, and we heard from Rails Bank on how they embed journeys in customers' life, how can you bring customers, new customers to the banks through the digital channels? So this has been a, this has been one of the big challenges that banks have faced traditionally, and today that is still common in a lot of the markets. So how do we actually fix this problem and is open banking providing some answers to address this issue? Fortunately, the, in the FinTech world, the situation is slightly different. Um, what we are seeing is increasingly year on year, there are more people who are happy to use apps or platforms provided by the fintechs to do their or service their banking and financial services needs. Now, this was not the case at the start, and there were a number of concerns around security, privacy, data, and so on, and reputation. But seems that is slowly starting to change, and you see customers are quite happy in a lot of the markets to use a third party app provided by a FinTech to service their requirements. Now this is real data. 
Okay, what else is going on? This is a bit of research from MIT um, that, that suggests that why is the people's customers move towards the third party apps working? Because the third party platforms, whether it is Grab or similar, are providing experiences that are more meaningful for the meaningful for the customer and takes the friction from the customer journey, right? Very similar to the example that Justin presented uh, with uh, embedded finance and uh, Rails Bank, uh, the ecosystems that can be created so more services that the customer can use on a single app seems to be more appealing to the customers than. Uh, just a banking app that allows you to uh, do your banking transactions. And this is further emphasized in this example, where you see two contrasting pictures on the left and the right. The left side says, this is where banks have traditionally invested in creating a omni-channel or a similar experience across multiple channels, whether it's mobile banking or internet banking, you go in there, go, you contact the bank to apply for a loan. Whereas in, in real life, my, my lifestyle needs, my personal needs around purchasing a home, a home buying experience is very different. So I need to be able to combine not just the banking services, but you know, compare properties, find the right property, uh, find the builders, find the designers, so on and so forth, compare loans before I can say, well, that sounds right. That is the loan I want. So you can see a lot of interactions going on in, in the person's mind. And this is why these ecosystem business models are more appealing. And this is why you see the shift of the consumer to platforms that allow ecosystem experiences as opposed to the banking experiences. Now, why are we talking about all of this at API Desk? Because the secret sauce or the glue that makes these ecosystem business models happen are the APIs, and you all know this. So let's run through some very quick definitions. I think these ones have been already covered by the previous presenters. So we know that open banking is where, where it all started, is the ability to share uh, customers' banking data in a secure and safe manner. And once the security and safety have been taken care of, then the customers are happy to have this information being shared with fintechs who can provide better services. Banking as a service is really now the ability to take that one a step further and allow anybody, anybody, any fintech to be a bank by embedding banking services from traditional banking providers into their platforms. And finally, embedded finance, I think we covered this one as well, is really taking that one a step further and saying those little services that you want to embed in your app experience, whether you are Grab or whether you are a club that wants to brand a card for your own use, you can do that quite easily because these services are now available in very easy to consume uh, APIs. All right, this is the only technical looking picture that I'm going to use, but it's worth understanding what are the building blocks that make up uh, make up an open banking or um, neo banking or embedded finance platform. Uh, if, if I build on top of open banking, you typically have on the right hand side, the banking banks or the banking platforms. On top of that, uh, in markets like UK and Australia, you have the re regulators who have defined what APIs to, APIs banks should provide. So they, those APIs fall into different classes of data sharing APIs, account and transaction sharing APIs, and payment initiation APIs. So you have a layer of APIs that banks are supposed to provide. But then again, those APIs by themselves have, don't have a lot of value, and we get to that one in a minute. And then on top of that, you have more aggregation services or so aggregation APIs that allow you to use services and data from multiple banks and allow product comparisons, uh, consolidated view of transactions, and choice of where you kind of you know execute the payments from. And finally, on top of that, the user experience, the user journey is you know formulated in a in an app. And that's where all the experience comes in. So these apps are now able to aggregate information from multiple bank accounts, similar to the SG Fit uh, index uh, kind of experience that you saw, but people are doing that with the aggregation platforms in other markets. Now, 
Why are we talking about it? Because these layers allow different business model options for the banks. And let's look at what some of those business model options are. Okay, on the on the left hand side to start with number one, uh, banks are expected to uh, in open, regulated open banking environments expected to provide open banking services. That's a little blue box you see at the bottom, and nothing else. So then there are fintechs or other aggregators who sit on top of that open banking layer to provide the aggregation and the app experience to the consumers. The second option, the banks. We're seeing now in certain markets, banks have done the open banking and now starting to realize just doing open banking may be a potential risk because what you're doing is essentially allowing customers to share their data. And then there are other parties, the aggregators on top of you who are providing more value-added services. So some banks are starting to shift towards becoming, uh, becoming aggregators uh, themselves. Third option is, so you are you are open banking provider, you are aggregator, and then you have more than one app being provided depending on the customer segment or consumer segment. And it really gets exciting from here onwards when you go to the next model where you say, actually, uh, I'm not providing services just to a small group of consumers. So I'm not just trying to build the apps in a B2C model. Now I can take those services that I have built, the aggregated service level, banking as a service level and i can provide those services to other organizations other smes who can target bigger pools of customers they have so as you can see as the models shifted from left to right uh, you are able to tap into and access bigger pools of customers because your distribution model is now shifting from just from being from b to c to a b to b to c the headline here is if the banks think only about compliance when they are doing open banking investing in open banking then that's all you get and that potentially can be a risk for banks so it's not a significantly huge investment to think about the next layer but thinking about more than compliance i think is very important in order to protect your market and grow your market Okay, so then we start to think about what are the types of different types of experiences you can create. And then you see, we see uh, different banks, uh, and we've also once again heard from the other presenters, the different types of experiences that you can create. On, on the retail side, we see banks providing uh, and the aggregators providing aggregated view of accounts, transactions, and that allows people to do product comparisons and provide uh, tips and recommendations that help wealth optimization and also then use pay via bank instead of credit cards to you know minimize the transaction cost so you can see a whole bunch of interesting value propositions that you can bring to the customers by being an aggregator on top of the open banking layer uh, and then once again the call out here is well think beyond just your bank uh, think about the customer experience uh, you know whether you are a, if you're a bank if you're a fintech, you're obviously doing that. So uh, that that's one of the styles of propositions you see. The second second style of proposition that we have seen and we have been part in implementing is that SMEs that everybody recognizes an underserved uh, group of people, group of consumers, and so we're targeting SMEs with a similar a similar style of products. Now you see uh, platforms evolving that allow SMEs to uh, do their invoicing, do their accounting, do their payments, uh, get paid via bank, and also add SME loans because you need to know that when you see the cash flow, you can help the SMEs manage their cash flows better. And sometimes cash flow crunches require loans. So it allows the banks and aggregators to package in more products and services to service the needs. So the call out here is the banks must really consider. Uh, the implementers must really consider the unique needs of the customers. And, and this is, once again, a big difference between just providing a, one bank's products and services versus an aggregated set of products and services because you are able to build a more compelling experience. Now, one of the things that we are also seeing is as people are implementing open banking, 
people are thinking of the solutions that they can do, uh, there is this interesting challenge of, you know, what's the right idea to build out, right? Uh, this I, I find this quite uh, quite interesting because a lot of the time uh, organizations think about ideation and idea generation uh, within the organization, uh, and and not often do people go out and ask people outside the organization for ideas. So one of the one of the large banks in Africa that we worked with um, went about it in a very interesting way. And that is even before we built the first set of APIs, we engaged the partner ecosystem to ask what kind of APIs and services they would need from the bank. And this was done even before 2018 when uh, UK Open Banking was uh, initiated. And here you see uh, across the top a whole range of uh, third parties, fintechs, other organizations who came to the bank to say, hey, uh, we would like to do you know, money transfers, we would like to do a simple loan for SMEs, um, and so on and so forth, a whole range of experiences. So when the bank was trying to create the platform, that platform was very well informed by uh, external, external teams or external participants who themselves in each case, brought a pool of new customers to the banks. So if you think back to my original chart of the digital channels were not uh, acquiring new customers, this allowed the APIs to actually drive customers acquisition in a very significant way. And, and those examples continue to grow. Now, this is this is a embedded finance example of a health and well-being platform that um, that the banks provide to their corporate customers. Uh, the corporate customers in turn offer it to their employees and employees can access a whole range of health and well-being services through it. And into that health and well-being services, uh, uh, you want to inject things like medical loans in a medical emergency insurance products, right? So once again, the banks and insurers are providing those APIs uh, in a way that they can be easily plugged into uh, an ecosystem, uh, ecosystem platform that brings together health and well-being services to people and banking and insurance financial services are seamless to access through that platform. Okay, so that's that's some examples of what's going on in the market and what we have been participating in. As 101 Digital, a Singapore-based fintech, what are we doing? We we actually believe in open banking for everyone. Open banking as a foundation needs to be in place for a lot of those business models to become real. Ultimately, this also helps the financial inclusion and accessibility of the services in different markets. So we are working hard to ensure that the the cost of implementing services, the effort of implementing this platform is minimized. So few initiatives that we are working on, uh, we've launched Open Banking Australia uh, platform, which aggregates uh, 30 plus banks in Australia, product information from it, and we provide a single API through which uh, that information can be accessed. This allows things like product comparisons, product information to be very easily embedded into consumer applications that are in that market. And we will be doing this across other markets. Uh, we have also launched uh, open banking as a service platform, free to sign up and anybody can sign up. On the left-hand side, it's called Bank API. That is providing, that is providing a starter set of uh, open banking APIs, very similar to what UK or Australian market uh, have implemented, together with a set of aggregation APIs and the apps that sit on top of it so that anybody can sign up and try open banking for real, uh, the APIs for real uh, with, with no investment, uh, no upfront investment at all. And for those people who are really following the market and interested in uh, who the participants are in the open banking space, who's providing APIs in different markets, we have also launched open banking directory. So if you are uh, open banking and uh, embedded finance enthusiast, 
please subscribe and you get updates on the information. If you are a fintech and you want to list yourself there, it's free to list, put yourself there. It's just really an information source and bringing you convenience. I'm going to pause there and I thank you for your time and attention and uh, I'll take any questions if there are any, John. Uh, Rana, thanks, thanks very much for that perspective. So um, there are, I have, I have some questions actually, because you know, you've, um, you've outlined how APIs simplify uh, the, uh, the integration with partners, which opens up uh, a world of uh, different business models, but also different services. And, but I can see also the, uh, the, the opportunities for integrating with lots of partners. So the, the thing that the question is raised in, in my mind is, well, with the ability to just because you can partner doesn't mean you should, um, with a, a large array of, uh, of companies, both within financial services, now maybe niche players who provide a specialist service or outside financial services, you mentioned a healthcare example. Um, there are, there are other, other types of uh, potential partners. How, how do you see um, banks prioritizing uh, the, how, they, how they go about selecting who are, the, who are the partners they really want to focus yeah. on? Because, of course, you, know, yeah. you could say, yeah, there's a long tail. Um, yeah. I, I want to integrate with as many people as possible. But yeah. to, to prioritize, you, to get the most out of yeah. your effort, you really yeah. need to prioritize. Yeah. Uh, re really, really good question, John. Um, so uh, in, the, in the example that I talked about in Africa, um, the bank actually ended up formulating a task force or a partner selection committee. And, and the main, main rationale behind that one was, whatever you do with APIs and whatever you do with embedded finance ultimately has to support your strategy, right? And, uh, and in terms of supporting your strategy, it's important to select your partners who are complementary to that strategy. So for example, uh, somebody might say, uh, my startup idea is to disrupt uh, the cards business. And, and the bank may not necessarily be comfortable with that idea. Yeah, so there is all, always a fine balance between uh, the partnerships and the, the partnerships, whether they are really complementary or whether they are threatening. So in, the, in those business models, as you think about it, and this is why I also see that, uh, you know, people have started with open banking initially and then uh, having a second thought about, oh, have we done the right thing by just stopping at open banking compliance and should we go one level further and should we be an aggregator so that we can control our own destiny so partnerships are very similar and and obviously you raise a good point and they need to be uh, mm. taken in case by case to decide yeah. the partners are right and and following on that there, there is a question in the chat about how how an aggregator can can actually make make money for this i mean the um there are the, the aggregator has to negotiate access with uh, the range of financial institutions that um, yeah. that they, they they want to partner with, and then they have to, uh, and then they provide that that access to um, uh, to to other parties. What what is the um, what, what types of uh, business model do you see there for the account aggregators? We we see we see a number of different models. Uh, banks, some banks have been, uh, once again, depends ultimately on the on the party provided the banking service. Uh, but we have seen models like uh, custom acquisition fee. So you bring in new customers, we will pay you a fee for uh, bringing in new customers. Uh, mm -hmm. Transaction volume based uh, uh, fees. Uh, so and, so similar models. And, and also there are other cases where banks go a little bit further and say, we will actually take some equity in your business uh, because we see you as a, a you know maybe a threat and an opportunity and we would like to have a little bit more control control on you so uh, there, there are of, of course the models are models are quite open and varied but we see all those models in play mm, okay um that's great great answer uh, i I'm appreciate Adita asking that that question in in the chat but um you you've uh, um you've gone beyond the it depends type of answer you've given us actual um 
uh, these three different examples of, of how uh, you can construct a business model around uh, around account aggregation. Thanks, thanks very much for that. Yeah, John. I think uh, I think you know in in the closing, what I kind of emphasize very much is that uh, you know compliance is important if you are uh, open banking compliant environment. But think beyond open banking compliance, and this is also the reason why we have launched our platform because. We want to offer like a holistic solution where people can pick and choose what they what they want. Um, you know, think of aggregation, BAS and embedded finance, not just open banking, because open banking itself could be quite risky. Uh, and leverage partners to scale and at the appropriate level. And uh, don't don't just build APIs for the sake of APIs, because technically everybody can build mm -hmm. APIs. Think build the APIs that have value. Talk to your partners before you build APIs. And mm -hmm. I think Singapore, as a mature market, understands this very well. But I guess if you're in other markets, it might be slightly mm -hmm. different. Yeah, I, I guess that we, we all rely on the regulator to lay the the, the foundation and set the the guardrails for how how um, these these partnerships can can occur. But then, I, I think regulators certainly uh, MAS. And, and other regulators are thinking, well, how can they how can they foster um, innovation um, by, by by setting that, that that foundation? Correct. Okay. Well, thanks uh, thanks very much, uh, Rana, for for sharing your your expertise. Thank you very much for having me, and um, yeah, I mean, enjoy the rest of the day.